You were right. That was very brief. <laughs> hey, I'm David Smith. I uh, work with Georgetown University. And a little bit about me. I'm an information security professional. Um, my job is information security officer for Georgetown University. And uh, really my biggest challenge nowadays is helping researchers build a security program to protect their data. Uh, we have a lot of insider threat and a lot of foreign threats uh, to research information. But uh, at GU, I also have a small uh, security consulting company where we focus on forensics. And uh, this, this talk is about the uh, Department of Defense Cyber Crime Center Digital Forensics Challenge in 2006. They uh, came out with this challenge. I think they're great. They're the kind of thing that like, lets you do something creative, uh, solve some problems, and then you get to see something back. And uh, my, I scheduled my team, Team Hoya Haxa, to come in and do this challenge. And uh, as you can see, we've got varied skill levels. Uh, most of us have two plus years of digital forensics. And we thought it'd be really cool. Um, Hoya Haxa is a, is a spirit name for Georgetown University. And it basically indicates, you know, what rocks or uh, very, uh, you know, just kind of exciting. But um, anyway, <laughs> sorry, these, I, my slides aren't really coming out as well as I'd like. But uh, anyway, the Department of Defense Cyber Crime Center, they have three major uh, divisions. And that's the Cyber Crime Institute, the Computer Forensics Laboratory, and the Cyber Crimes Investigation Training Academy. And if you know anybody from DC3, there may be a lot of them here. They have information about what they do and how they do it, and it's, it's very useful. Uh, basically, it's research, development, testing, and evaluation. There's lots of security problems out there to solve, and uh, forensics is a very, very tough field. Um, you never know. It's just following leads to get more leads and, and, and do all kinds of things, and what you can get and what you can't get. But uh, that's really what I thought these competitions were all about. Uh, I kind of made a shot here. Uh, one of the things about DC3 this year was we all submitted our data, and we didn't get anything back. Um, and I found out later, luckily, <laughs> that uh, it was that there was a problem and it, just, it couldn't happen. They didn't have the scheduling down to make it happen. But uh, originally I was like, oh, cheap R&D, man. That's all we are. But uh, that was why I did this talk. I wanted to return the stuff that we learned on these all these challenges. Um, there was a whole bunch of them. There was broken media and there was a boot to a DD draw, boot a DD image into a virtual uh, machine, uh, data carving, all kinds of fun stuff, uh, key log breaking. And we wanted to go and solve each one of these and talk about what we did. We also came up with a lot of methodologies and some software to help with that. And uh, we'll get into that. But that's really what this, this, this talk is about. It's what we learned and kind of that give back. You know, I wanted somebody to at least get the information that we did. And I understand for the, this year's contest, 2007, they will be doing this. So I'm pretty excited about it. And we, of course, heard about this through Slashdot. And I'm sure it really got Slashdotted pretty hard, as well as uh, there was a follow-up in Network World. So it's now called the 2006 Challenge because we got a new one. And we basically had 140 teams from all over the world sign up to do this. And uh, quick breakdown, I'm not going to read them to you. But uh, the prize is that you get an all-expense paid trip to their conference, which is pretty cool, especially if you love digital forensics. And you get bragging rights. And uh, I'm not going to give away who the winner is, but uh, I'm sure that they, they've used their bragging rights quite well. Um, here's where some of the base dates, um, September. Uh, was when it basically challenges were sent, and then it was the 15th of December, so about three months to really get things going and to get it in. Um, the rules of engagement were pretty straightforward. After the uh, new registrations came in, you know, you must submit in their format. Um, you, have to, you don't have to complete all challenges. You can get partial points. And that if you build the tools, they want a copy of it. And uh, we had no problems there. And that the biggest hint was that there's a secret bonus out there. Um, and these are what the challenges were. Uh, there was a media, two media recoveries. There was a broken CD. It came in a nice little package. Very exciting. Uh, broken CD and, and floppies that were cut. Um, there was a, a couple images. There was a, a data carving on an L, a Linux LVM, Logical Volume Manager. Um, there was some images that you had to like boot up into a virtual machine. And this was a really cool one. I've seen some other talks spawned off of this. But uh, image analysis, how do, you, how do you say that this is a real picture versus this is a computer generated picture? And if you look at some of the forums out there, you'll just be blown away by these pictures that these artists can create. Um, and it's, it's a really tough field. It's, it's very, there's nobody out there that can do it all. And I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, some password cracking, some key log cracking. I'm sure everybody here is familiar with some of those things. And uh, stenography and audio stenography. And that, uh, those were the things we didn't really do very well on, but uh, they're interesting nonetheless. And it, it really tells you how secure some of this stuff is. Um, some quick stats. So this is now we're getting into a little bit about the data about the contest that I really wanted to see originally. I wanted to see some of this, this stuff put out. But um, 
uh, 25 submitted out of the 140, and we were pretty blown away by that. Um, they, the rules came out at one point in time after they went over 100 packets where they were like, only the first 100 are going to be returned and graded. So we're like, oh, no, we're going to have to make sure we send in early. <laughs> and only 25 did total. Um, the best team got 78% of the points, which I was pretty amazed at. When we got these packets, we thought this stuff was really, really hard. And the worst team, somebody submitted and didn't get any credit. But uh, the best challenge was out of those 25 teams, only the best challenge anybody did on was 11 of them were able to take the CD that came in two pieces and get the data off of it. And then, of course, the... The uh, least completed challenge was the boot of split DD, and that's, um, we'll get into it later, but it's basically three DD images that you had to reconstruct in memory and then boot to it, and only one team managed to get that, and they were also the winners. So the first challenge, hopefully getting into the meat of this thing a little bit, um, this is what we got, and they said basically the examiners must develop and document a methodology to recover data from a damaged compact disk. And we learned some really cool things, I'm going to get into that at the end, uh, but right now I'm going to focus on just the challenge pieces. Uh, we had to recover some known data. And again, this was 44%, so it was the highest uh, completed challenge. And there were no partial points given. It was just the top five. I actually break out the top five scoring, so the teams that did the, to made the top five, um, these were the ones that did it, so everybody pretty much got it. Um, and then it was, uh, we actually got this one on the very first day we got the packet. And uh, hopefully you guys can see this, but uh, it's actually a CD, it's, it's, it's not split down the middle, but it's split off, um, you know, what, what do you call that? Like. Uh, now, now let's just say 20, 25% um, of the CD is split on the edge. And um, what we did was we just took a ton of split CD. We started cutting them ourselves uh, using kitchen tools and Zacto knives and everything you can think of. And we found this to really be the big trick. Uh, it's called D-skins. And what they are, they're like these little CD condoms. And you slip them on, and they actually will hold the CD together. Because what you need is you need to get structural integrity on this contest. Um, and you can kind of see it here. I'm, I'm, I'm worried that you can't really see it very well. But it's got the D-skin on it, and you can see the split down the side. And in this, in this competition, let me go back one. The, um, where the split is, there's, it's basically, a, we found it to be 11 megs. Uh, what, what the goal was, was you just had to keep structural integrity so you could read the inside data. And uh, because it looked like a giant file, and you can see it only goes so far out, it's not the hole because of the little line. Again, you can't see that, but um, I was kind of hoping you would. <laughs> Uh, we were actually able to pull off 11 megabytes right off the bat. And it kept saying the same thing over and over, which is I love to hear myself talk. And uh, this is access data, forensics imager. I think it's free for non-commercial use. Um, but uh, anyway, it's the kind of thing you can, um, with CDs, there's all kinds of tricks that you can do to get it to read. And if you look at some of the forums, like CD Freaks, it's all about these mass duplicators of, of CDs and DVDs, but they've done incredible work on, you know, writing, rewriting firmware and uh, doing things to help you read the disk better. So it's, it's kind of neat, but um, it, it's a good place to go if you want to get into sort of data recovery and doing these kinds of things. Uh, the next one was floppy diskette, right? You've got a floppy diskette. In our case, um, for top four teams got it. And then in the, you can see which ones are. There were no partial points. You either were able to read the floppy or not. So that was kind of interesting. But uh, again, <laughs> can you guys see this OK? Can most people see the little pieces of tape and, and things like that back in the room? A little bit? OK. A little feedback. <laughs> but uh, anyway, the whole trick is how do you, how do you get this, this floppy just to spin up? And how do you get it to read? So if you've got anything on the drive, it's going to make that head bounce. And you're not going to get a read for that. Uh, and we tried lots of stuff. Our best experience, and this is kind of what this talk is all about, is how we use splicing tape and what's the best way. We actually tried over 20 methods. Uh, we tried super glue. We tried nail polish. Everything on the Internet that we've seen of people, what people do. Uh, if you have to recover something off a damaged floppy, and hopefully floppies are dead, so you won't ever have to do it again. But um, over and over and over, we kept trying all kinds of things. And our best trick was very thin strips of splicing tape on just one side. And it was what, what destined to be the bottom side. And um, that just, we were able to read it and we were able to pull the most data off. I think at one point we actually got like a 45% of the disk, which was kind of nice. In a testing environment, uh, we were able to get over 60, ones when we cut it ourselves. But on the actual final media, um, you also want to open up the, the container just enough to slip it in. So you want to have a really, really good, uh, solid um, floppy disk in kind of the enclosure to protect it. But that was kind of cool. Um, has anybody here really done any of this stuff before as far as like data recoveries and CDs and floppy disks? Hopefully you've got some hands, right? <laughs> it's, uh, it's actually harder than it looks. I mean, when we first started, we tried all kinds of things and we read all kinds of things on the Internet. But um, 
we've had to do it a few times for a couple of investigations that we do throughout Georgetown University. But uh, the end result is our old friend, DD. We were able to make this image and uh, use no error in sync so it doesn't bomb out and it's going to give us the whole, the whole packet. Um, whether even if it's just zeros, it's going to keep it the original media size. And our secret message was Jack Bauer was my hero. So DC3's got some things on their mind. Um, the next challenge was to boot the DD image. And if you, uh, if you know what a DD image is, when you make an image of a hard drive, uh, DD is a great, it's just a disk copy. It makes a binary image of whatever the media is that you're dealing with. So if you've got a 60 gig hard drive and you make a DD image, you've got a 60 gig, uh, a 60 gig file. And that's an exact image, exact copy of your hard drive. I actually made one of my laptop before I left to come here to DEF CON so I could actually delete everything I want off of it and then come back and bring it. But in this particular challenge, what they did was they gave you a DD and they say, we want you to boot this up and actually boot the image. Um, so be able to look at it and then walk around inside the image doing a live analysis of this image. And uh, that was pretty interesting, right? I mean, we've never, we've built, done DD images, but we've never actually done this before. And so we were pretty excited to try it out. Um, only 16%, four out of 25, managed to get this. Uh, we were one of the teams, so we were all happy about that. Um, and uh, five teams got half score, so we were, that was pretty exciting too. So a good total nine out of the 25 were able to get something on this. Uh, the initial image showed that it was the XT3, a Linux kernel 2.6. And then understanding this challenge really meant understanding, you know, booting into a VM and what that entails. Um, obviously, VMware is, is kind of the big one out there. But um, you know, we identified two major issues to get started. Partition imaging, uh, partition image needed to be converted into a disk image, so it was just a partition image. And then that partition image did not have the master boot record, and there was no boot manager, so we had nothing to boot it with. Um, we use QEMU, is anybody familiar with that? It's, uh, it's another, okay. It's another uh, VMware-like product where it's just a virtual image uh, or a virtual machine. And uh, the thing I like about it is they really let you do on the second example here, HDA Linux.bin. So I mean that is my hard drive, HDA hard drive, and then my second one. So it was really easy. VMware I found it to be kind of cumbersome to write the to write the file or use their use their GUI to write my file. But um, in this case, we wanted what we wanted to do was create an image. We wanted to boot up into a small version of Linux and then partition it so we could actually make the partition. And again, we're doing what were kind of our identified issues were, which were we needed to get it to a disk image so we could boot to it, and then we need to have some way of having a master boot record and boot manager. Um, once we did that, we uh, used the dash L for QEMU just means look for the BIOS information here in this, in, this, in this directory. But what we did was we took the disk image and then we added in our challenge DD. And then once we booted up, we were actually able to partition it and then use DD with an in, in source and a destination to uh, take that entire HDC, which was the image, and move it into HDB, which was, is our partition. So it makes a full disk image. And now we're ready to be booted. And uh, I actually had a small version of CentOS, which I like. It's, it's kind of the, the distribution I use. And I was able to boot into it. And it already had Grub all set up. And I already knew what I was looking for as far as the, I already knew what I was looking for as far as where the Linux kernel information was. And so I went in and I just manually typed it in. Uh, luckily, you can tab this stuff, so that's pretty nice. Um, but I was able to type it in and point it to our target image, which is theirs, and uh, type in boot, nice. And I'm actually able to get it. So this is actually now booting their DD image. Um, it was pretty nice. So we really met our two goals, and hopefully you can read this okay. It actually looks better. I guess that's my angle. Um, you can see I actually did a couple pictures. And then once I got there, I found a, a directory called challenge, and your quest was finished. So that was kind of cool. Any questions kind of up to date so far? Or? Where we're going here? Okay. Um, the next one, very, very, it's a lot tougher, right? Because now you've got a split DD. It's multiple files. I don't just have one. And they specifically, specifically said, and you may not concatenate the slices into one big image, right? Because imagine this, uh, you know, if they're 20 gigs each, you know, how are you really going to splice 20 gigs in, in, or, you know, maybe even 100 gigs each? And you're not really going to be able to splice that into a giant file and then work it in most systems. So um, that was really what they're trying to do is you've got to find a way to in memory uh, splice these things. So you've got three source files and then it just knows that when I hit this barrier, I start reading the next file, excuse me. <coughs> and uh, anyway, we did not get points for this one. The only one person got, the only one team, I should say, got this, got this challenge and they got the full 500 points. That was a pretty big point score for it. Um, Three teams got half, which is pretty good. And when you look at it, it was uh, 
the 40 Thieves, the Professionals, and Hacked Factor got the 250, and Access Data got the 500. So that was a pretty big deal. Um, it was definitely one of the toughest ones. Um, we didn't get this, and uh, I didn't get any points, but we actually kind of screwed up the write-up. I was hoping to get partial points, and I believe I would have, um, but I submitted an earlier copy, and uh, so it's kind of my protocol error. But um, we knew it would be similar to the Boot DD, and we knew we had to combine the files. That was the challenge piece. Um, I had been working with, and you can't see it, unfortunately, because it got cut off, but this content was provided by the professionals, which were the third place team for Florida State University. And here's actually, we're getting right into the VMDK format of what they did. And you're going to need something like this to go ahead and beat a challenge like this. If you ever have to do it in the real world, um, I think this is going to be the best way to go. I'm, I'd love to hear how Access Data did it. Uh, maybe there's somebody here and we can get them up at the end or something like that. But uh, it was, uh, we were looking around these lines and we just, we couldn't put it together in time. But we definitely thought it was interesting. Uh, I'm going to move right on here to the Linux LVM uh, interpretation. Hmm. Anyway, it's a data carving exercise. And uh, we got a logic volume management. Now, I don't know if anybody's ever, like, lost their information or screwed up their volume management. Um, and you have nothing. You know, it's basically at that point you're doing a full carving exercise. Uh, it's happened to me a few times, actually. I don't know why I keep doing it. But uh, anyway, the same thing. They're like, you've got this LVM, and there's, just, there's a ton of data with almost with no, no table of contents, no fat, no nothing. And um, you had to find it. You know, they said there's a deleted file on this thing somewhere. You need to tell me where it is. So uh, I went through. 20% uh, of the teams got full points, and then 8% got partial. So again, it was, it was kind of, as far as they go, it was pretty tough. And uh, sure enough, it was LVM volume. And we imported it into FTK, non-topsy, and NKs. And I like WinHex. I'm, my team laughs at me for that. But uh, anyway, we look at it, and there's really nothing. I mean, it's all files. It's all text. They're all combined together. If you've ever done a data carving exercise, you kind of know the feeling of, like, man, I'm looking, really looking at, like, seven or 8,000 files that mean absolutely nothing to me. Um, and it's LVM. So we, the first thing we had to do was we had to unwrap it because we couldn't get, we couldn't see it like the under, we couldn't see XT3 or anything because of the LVM wrapper. So again, I went to QEMU, uh, plus I love the open source. And I, in this case, what I did was I actually booted up the image uh, along with my image. I got a little bit out of order this time. And uh, I used, I started using those volume tools. I have to make it active and I have to change it so it's active. Here's a trick, um, and this has probably made it tough. Originally my team, I went to first team member and then second team member. But uh, if you try to boot it up on your regular regular Linux or whatever you got, you're going to hit up with, it's the exact same volume name as what's already installed. So, you know, you're like, oh, what, I got I to go in and change my volume names. And that actually caused a data loss on my team. But uh, no, 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 use Helix or something like that and just boot into that because it loads up all the LVM drivers and everything you need but you don't have to uh, change any of the names. It just, it just loads the drivers for you. And that probably would have been the best thing to do, but you know, again, we're, we're, we're working the challenge. For some reason, we're like running as hard as we can on this. It was kind of crazy. Uh, it was all off hours, so it was, you know, I was paying for lunches for my team and trying to get them to come for after hours work and things like that because uh, I'm just, I love these kinds of challenges and excitement. I mean, it's pretty exciting for me. Uh, the next thing, we, yeah, we made our image, right? So now we've got a real life image and we can see that it's ext 3 and that there's two folders, uh, root and lost and found. That ah, is what we found. <laughs> anyway, uh, looks a little bit better like this. We can actually see that there's a couple of deleted files. And um, I'm actually really known for running down the wrong path. Um, part of what my process is is I have somebody that's near me and says, wait, 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 you're, you're spinning around the axle on this, stop. And um, anyway, so I start running down the wrong path. I'm like, data carving. So I go out and get scalpel, and I start doing a little bit of extra research on magic recovery, which I've never had to use. Uh, funny that F times and scalpel have always been there enough for me. But uh, so I start thinking, like, this is going to be tough, and um, I'm going to write recipes. But uh, no. <laughs> I did lots and lots of searching, and I found, like, you know, just gigabytes of files. And, you know, even though there's 800 total, you know, by the time it starts cut, doing all the cutting and stuff like that, you get into gigs. And then it hits me. There was a file, when you go back, called readme.readme.text.swap. And if you're familiar with VI and it does this recovery, you're immediately like, oh, bam. And so it really was after like hours of me screwing around, doing all this stuff, my team members are laughing at me. Um, I, uh, I'm like, I just got to find the magic for VI and the swap file. So of course I scour the internet, running down the wrong path. I scout the internet, I'm looking high, low, high, low. Can't find it, I really can't. And then of course, I just go and create one myself. And I get it and I get the magic out. And this is the magic, uh, you know, again, I couldn't even find it in Google. I'm like, you know, what is the magic? What is the, the hex, you know, header, you know, all this good stuff for VI. And uh, that's it. 
62, 30, 50, no, I'm just and uh, I cut it down, and sure enough, I get five great hits, or yeah, four great hits, excuse me. And of course, the first one I highlighted it because it's the one I like the best. And sure enough, uh, that's it. I get a nice, you know, I get the machine that it's on and what the path is and everything that was part of it, and then a whole bunch of space because it gives you all kinds of padding. But uh, the answer in this case was water is a refreshing beverage. So that was kind of our challenge goal, and uh, we were pretty happy. Actually, we jumped up and down on this one, believe it or not. Uh, the next, it starts getting really interesting here, metadata extraction. Um, you know, guys, I remember, I remember there, was a, there was a Washington Post article a while back about a botnet herder, and he was like, you know, doing it anonymously, and uh, they put his picture on the website. And he was like, you know, anonymous, and he's like, I live in a small town, I, I, I didn't graduate I didn't graduate high school, and da 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 da, da. I see some people laugh, so hopefully they remember this. But what happened was they left the metadata in there, and they actually got the GPS coordinates of this small town. And then based on the other clues, they're like, oh, I live near the used car sales lot. They were actually to be able to place this guy's house within, like, I think it was a mile radius. Of, this is where this guy lives. <laughs> And it was like, you know, people that were just kind of on this little forum that were talking about this, I'm pretty sure the FBI was there too because he really was talking about, like, hurting thousands of botnets and, and uh, making all this money and, you know, how he really wants to quit and he feels bad about what he does, you know, because he knows he's going to get caught eventually. But uh, he didn't think talking to the Post was going to lead it so quickly. But um, anyway, it was just interesting. You know, we, we, we heard about that. And I, at the time I went out, I was like, oh, I'm going to brush up on metadata. But uh, actually a good percentage at least got partial points on this. Uh, the top four teams, plus you know a whole bunch of others, got the full 200. And uh, metadata, it's data about data. You know, hopefully everybody's familiar with that whole paradigm. Yes, you can be data and metadata at the same time. In um, this challenge, it was 13 files with 23 questions, and the questions were just crazy. But uh, here's a nice picture, and this this is a picture, and it's got a ton of metadata in it. In fact, it's got 61 metadata datums inside this one picture. As you can see, I'm just I'm not going to run through all of these, but yeah, this one's got the GPS. It's got the tracking. I mean, I sure hope that I didn't, you know, get to let you get a picture of my silhouette and tell you that I'm, I'm hiding from the law here. But um, uh, my security analyst, Trent Beckett, was the one who Googled, Googled found this out. He uh, identified all of the, the primary metadata data types, um, ID3 for MP3 and EXIF, uh, TIFF, OLAP, and XML. Um, anybody got anything they want to add to that? Just shout it out. I mean, I kind of thought our list was incomplete, but I was just going to come with this. Uh, we found all kinds of tools, but then we found this to be the bomb, XIF Extractor by Phil Harvey. It'd be great if Phil was here. We definitely love his product. Um, it actually found 12 of the 13 files without any other work. I mean, this was a pretty easy one for us to do. Um, he updated earlier this year, and uh, it supports almost everything that we, we found. Um, the one it didn't get, I actually think I mentioned in a couple of slides, the yeah, image magic we used. But here are some of the questions, like, you know, what is the MS stereo and intensity, stero and intensity stereo settings? And we just going through the image data, we were able to go all through all this, but uh, what types of encodings were used and what's the date and name, and um, that's German for file name, all this good stuff. But uh, anyway, but it was pretty exciting. And it's, you know, use it, you know, you'll definitely, you'll get pictures that you'll process, and you can use those to, uh, to see what's in it. And now I do it regularly for like news photos, just to see what I can get out of it. It's kind of fun. Um, all this is on the, on the CD, so you'll, you'll get these links and everything that I'm using. The next one was a secret bonus, right? And it was the, the clue was you'll know it when you see it, and we were excited about this. So um, anyway, it was all or nothing, 36% got the full points. And of course, in the top five, it uh, looks like uh, one, two, and four got the full 300 points. And sure enough, we saw it right away. Hopefully you can see this okay, but it was on everything. It was on the CD that came, the media CD. You can see damage media at the bottom. It was on the little folder that it came with, and it was up on their website, actually, where I pulled that from. And it's just a binary, and it doesn't look like just straight binary that people, you know, love the background on. It's, it actually says something. So I like breaking codes, and again, since I always go down the wrong path, I'm not very good at it, although I try a lot. Um, anyway, binary to ASCII, woohoo! we got something that looks right, you know. Actually, there was like colons and things in there too, um, and that that got kind of pulled out of here because most of the tra translation products we use. But uh, yeah, it was like uh, DC three. The three stayed in there. Oh, and then the colons there. I take that back. And so it's kind of like okay, I know I'm onto something. Like here is this is the word, you know, and uh, you know it looks monoalphabetic. You know, simple substitution. We were like, you know, this is cryptogram, right? And then based on the three and the colon, you know, plus the looks. And here's the tools I like to use. I like I love Crypto MX. Uh, it does all kinds of it does all kinds of uh, translations and substitutions. It keeps tracks for you, so that's pretty neat. And I like Crypto Helper a lot. 
Um, it's actually got like a couple brute forcers in there. For um, and actually used it this year for the ShmooCon encryption for Playfair, um, and that was actually I managed to get that before they gave out that it was Playfair. I was worried, I was hoping I would be one of the few people because it was a tough, it was tough to look at it and uh, and realize that uh, what it was. But uh, it converted it from binary, and then we did the free frequency analysis on Crypto Helper, and that was kind of cool. Um, they also has a nice feature called Run the Alphabet, which is just rot 1 through 26, but you never know what you're going to get. And sure enough, uh, it told us that uh, to email DC3 the secret word, which was Hummer. Yes, I like Hummers too. Um, and that was kind of it. That was, that was exciting. That was 300 points that we got pretty early on. It was nice. Um, Keylog cracking. This is one that we didn't get, but the object was to decrypt and recover uh, the contents of a keylog file. And, uh, you know, we kind of like, what, what's the methodology for this? You know, how are we, how we going to do it? Um, I went down the wrong path again, and I started, like, actually, <laughs> like, working it, you know. I mean, I was honestly, like, really doing everything I had, throwing everything I had at it. Um, no team got the full points because it was two key logs, and one was encrypted and one was not. So the, the challenge, and again, I should have looked at that and said, hey, you know what, that probably means that uh, there's two of them. Probably one's easy, one's hard, and one gets you into the right arena, and the other one is we've got to do some work. But uh, nobody got the full points on it. And uh, and this is the right methodology to do. And this was also provided by the professionals because, again, I went down the wrong path. I'm actually, like, doing substitutions. And I was doing my ASCII charts and my hex charts. And I really was just all over the place. And, you know, I'm, like, my hair's all standing straight up and everything like that and uh, working it. And I actually said to one of my guys, like, damn, while I'm doing this, somebody should go out there and Google. You know, find every keylogger you got out there and just plug these in and see what you get. And it turns out that Mike McDonald from the team professionals um, he went and did that, and he's also started up a forensics company as well. Um, so I want to pl I'll plug that at the end. But um, actual spy turned out to be the the key log, and of course it was one of the ones that had the free sample. Um, and uh, we went, and actually we you did the same thing. Um, this is what it looked like before, um, like down there. And I actually had it where when you look at that first line, to me it was clearly a date and time because it was very few differences between the first one and the second one. And uh, I kept saying that's a date timestamp, so I was doing all my cracking based on like 2007, 08, 06, you know, all this good stuff with slashes, and it was crazy. I'd love to show you some of that work. But uh, no, no, it turns out that it's not. Um, and it's actually, they started with the same shift space shift, and that actually was the, exactly what I was, I kept going after because it was a shift space. Those were the same characters over and over, and it just happened to match what a time date stamp field would look like. But uh, this was actually the screen capture of the first one once it's decrypted. And you can actually see it basically says uh, preferred recycle pads of paper, how about you, right? So of course, you know, one-time pads, if you recycle them, that's very, very bad. Um, and that was basically it. I mean, that's when you think about it, if you find it in the wild, you're finding key logs and how you're gonna break them, you're gonna do exactly this methodology. You're gonna go out there and see what one's out and what exists. Well, first thing you're gonna do is determine, is it made up? Is it somebody who's doing some ossification, or is it something, you know, that's, that's part of a package? And in most cases, it's part of the package. So you just need to track it down and see it. I'd love to see, like, a database or a website or something, and maybe I'll do that, of all the different ver all the different versions and then kind of what, how they look once they're encrypted and things like that. That would definitely help investigators or people just doing this for fun uh, track it down a little bit easier. Um, this is a great one, and uh, it's image analysis, and it's something that fascinated me the most. We didn't actually submit anything for it. Uh, part of our problem was we either did the challenge, got full credit, or we didn't do it. <laughs> you know, all the ones that like that, that looked like this, and they were interested in it. We just we saw the amount of work it was going to take, and the amount of um, kind of when we add some learning curves and things like that. We started using MathLab and doing some things like that, and it was just too much for us. And we were like, oh, you know, throw this one away. We we don't we don't know we're going to do well, but. Um, Nobody got full points, and uh, basically 24% got partial. The best being 170 out of 250, and um, yeah, and just the remaining of the lowest was 55, but still had something. It was uh, um, Dr. Krantz, who I saw earlier today. He uh, he did very well, and he actually has done some additional work on this um, because it's a really really interesting field as far as how do you, what kind of things can you do to tell. Um, never met anybody from Penn State, but uh, they actually got the high score, which really impresses me because I've seen some of the methodologies and I've learned a lot more about it since the contest has ended. And uh, it's, it's very challenging. It's definitely. Um, and again, this is, it says it on the bottom, for the content provided by the professionals. But uh, real images are captured by cameras, and they can be altered and uh, scanned from actual print films. But CGs, you know, they're, they're created. And, uh, you know, all the different products. And where do we begin? We did also say that all innocent, all images are innocent until proven guilty. 
And uh, you know, you look at it, and you're naturally, your brains are these incredible machines where they're like, oh, that's fake, right? It looks fake to me. His nose is too long, or the shadow's wrong, or I can't prove it, but it, it feels fake to me. And uh, you know, but statistical advantage, uh, statistical tests, you know, they have to, they have to win the day because those are unbiased, they're forensically sound, reproducible results. You can stand up in court and say, hey, I thought it was bad, or you can say, here's a graph showing it's bad. Um, and they'll probably believe the graph, of course. But uh, we went with the high bridge approach as well. We didn't go very deep. But um, when I talked to Mike and then we, we kind of went over some stuff afterwards, it was, it was really cool. Uh, we don't think any method. I don't even think a combination of methods equal 100% accurate. Um, I, mean, I want to get some experts behind me to really confirm that. But um, this is what uh, working with Matt, uh, Matt, excuse me, Mike afterwards, uh, visual inspection, color frequency histograms, fast Fourier transforms, metadata, surface plots. I like that he wanted to like hide some of his information, like other oh, individual tests and other statistical tests, because he actually created uh, some some additional uh, tests that he could do that actually provided value. And um, I think he's actually patenting a few of them. But uh, what he did was he took the cumulative scores uh, that increased the overall confidence into the final decision. And uh, this is this is it. This is uh, you be the judge here. Um, I haven't seen my guy here, but anyway. Uh, which one's real and which one's fake? And this was one of the contest actual entries. It was, it was funny that I saw a presentation earlier and they used this exact image. I was like, oh my God, how'd they know? But uh, anyway, it's really cool because uh, it was found by Google. You know, this was in, one of these images was the one that was in the contest and then they used Google images to, to find out the other one. But um, anyway, that one is the real. So that's actually the original. And this was just completely from the ground up rendition. And earlier in the week, I learned that uh, there's a lot of differences in the in the space suit and the, and the way the, the wrinkles are and everything like that. And it was made up of two, the, the artist took two separate pictures. He took the original image and then he took, uh, the, and it was an exhibit. And he took the picture from the exhibit. And that's Dr. Krantz as well. Um, I think I'm worried here. I got lots of lots of slides, of course. But uh, password cracking, you know, that's, that's a tough one. Everybody's been doing that for years. Um, and the challenge was ranging from 40 bit to 256 bit and points awarded. It came in a total of four files. Um, no team really did well. Um, all got partial. Seven teams actually got 20 points out of 250. So it actually was better than I thought. Uh, we were surprised that access data got a zero because, oops, that's what they do, right? <laughs> that's one of the things they do is they have their password recovery toolkit. And uh, it was four files. And uh, here's, here are the examples of the passwords that were on those files. Um, we honestly, we didn't even come close on this. We, I think we ran it for like a month or two, and then we're like, ah, you know, let somebody else get that one. But um, I like number two here. You know, that, that's all uh, Unicode, right? Or um, ANSI, excuse me. That's, you know, Unicode, sorry. And uh, we, I don't think we would have gotten that, no. <laughs> the other ones were a little bit easier. Um, you know, that's actually a nine letter, 72 letter key space file. We could have got that maybe in a couple years. And then the, uh, that is Unicode at the bottom. We, uh, we didn't miss that. I, I had to guess that's what everybody got, the, the people that got the partial, the 20 points. I think they got the, the Chinese document because they did tell you that it was Chinese in the name of the file. Um, and this is kind of where we didn't, this is kind of wrapping some things up here, but uh, sonography using S tools. It's a really great product. I think your data is very secure. I think there's a lot of real experts out there that will tell you the same thing, but uh, you want to check with them. Um, two teams got 50 points out of 200. Um, and really, some of the passwords that came out were really password. And yet what you had to do was say that, it, yes, there is sonography in here, and then you had to look at it and say that here's what, they were all password protected. So once we were able to identify, um, you then had to turn around and, and actually uh, break it. So we started writing some brute force um, to do this stuff, and then we didn't get any. But um, some people did. And Access Data got 40, and the professionals got 20. So that was actually really cool. I guess that was one and two out of those things. Uh, the audio, we didn't touch that as well. It was, it was, really, it was really tough. It got a partial turnout. Uh, three teams submitted, and again, they got the low. So it was really tough. It's actually in the 2007 contest. They're also doing another audio sonography for you to, to crack, and, and hopefully more people will build out their methodologies. I wish I could share them with you. Um, that's what we really tried to do is kind of say, this is how we did this, and this is how we went after this. Um, here's the kind of things that we, we attempted to do and what we tried to learn from it. Um, we actually submitted a little bit early, now getting into the results here. And this is kind of where I like is the information about how hard these challenges were. Uh, we wanted to submit early because we were sure, you know, oh, you know, 140 people signed up. And, uh, you know, we estimated that we had 64% complete, which turned out to be off because uh, we, we counted a challenge that uh, we didn't, we ended up not getting any points on. But uh, anyway, we got this back. We were really excited that we were in the top four. So we were in the fourth place. 
and that the uh, professionals who we had, I think we had chatted with them, but we didn't really talk to them until after the contest was over. And they also broke it out by academic and civilian and commercial and government and military. So, um, yep, Dr. Krantz came in first for the uh, civilian sector, and we came in, I think it was third for academic. And uh, the grand prize winner was, of course, the grand champion was Access Data, makers of the forensics toolkit. I'd like to hopefully see that there's more uh, real forensics companies um, because, you know, I, I need to learn more. And that's the thing is that's, that's part of why I'm doing this is to share what I know. But uh, I'd like to see some of these contests produce some of either tools or methodologies that we can use. Um, I actually read a lot of books, so it's, it's, that's, you know, that's the kind of stuff, too, if you want to write in a book and then I can read it. But uh, <laughs> anyway, when it comes down to it, 78% was completed by Access to Data, the grand champions, and that was pretty exciting. Um, I actually broke out the scores a little bit. You can see we blanked on the first four, at least Team Hoya Haxa. And uh, those were the ones that we, I guess, most of these we didn't focus on. We wanted to do the image analysis, and we probably put about 15 hours into it, and then it kind of got abandoned. But uh, we did better on this round where we didn't get the split boot, the split DD, but uh, we were able to get the data carving and the media, which is the big score, 1,000, and uh, the floppy, and then we missed on the key log. And then the final was a secret bonus and the metadata extraction. Um, this is the final scorecard. And this really shows you how tough the competition really was. Um, it seems easy now that I'm like relaying it, but uh, yeah, but it was pretty tough. And uh, we actually did a lot of different things, and we learned a ton. I mean, that's part of what this is. And I think all the remaining slides are some of the things I learned about media and, and uh, things from there. But here's some thanks, right? Mike McDonald from team, the excellent team at FSU. I met Dr. Krantz earlier this week and uh, a little bit from before. He shared some great information. And then access data for winning it. And of course, DC3. I mean, I. I don't know how many of you are here, but uh, <laughs> say hi to me, please. I definitely enjoyed your competition, and I'm excited that uh, hopefully on the next one that uh, we're going to get some more information out on the methodology because that's really what I'm up here for. And then the makers, of, I use a ton of tools from all kinds of different people, and I wish I could thank them all. And, of course, my Georgetown team. And uh, this is an attempt to share all the weird tips and tricks we learned. And this is kind of where I want some participation from some people, but uh, your mileage is going to vary, so feel free to shout out what works for you. Um, and please don't give me any of the heard this works, but firsthand knowledge only. But uh, for data recovery, uh, one of the things that we found is, have you ever seen it where the, the foil starts to come up? Uh, what we did was we actually said, hey, you know, this was, actually took me a while to learn this, but uh, use those labels. You can use the labels, and that'll keep the foil down. So if you have damaged uh, media that's been broken, like a CD, you can actually put that label on it, and it'll keep that, that foil from coming in. Because once that foil comes up, you're gone. I mean, it's, the dye is dust, basically. And uh, if that, as soon as that gets messed up, that's it. Those pits are gone, and you won't ever get that data back. <laughs> I found things on the Internet, and I've seen books, actually, that tell you that if you lose any of that foil, your media is gone. And that's not true. We actually were using a silver spray paint, and it basically, one, it gives it the right reflection, but then, two, it actually um, keeps that dye from going anywhere. And uh, combine some spray paint with the label, it actually it lets you, you know, attempt to recover sectors on a disk. There is a trick that you have to do. And originally I wasn't going to share it, but I'm, I'm going to share it now. But if you ever get it where it says media, invalid media, right? Like you put the disk in and it says, I can't read this. Well, what you want to do is you want to open up your CD-ROM drive, or hopefully not your good one, <laughs> but open up a CD-ROM drive, take the cover off. Um, you'll find a little clip that keeps the disk down. And then what you do is you put the CD in. You can see it spinning. You have the clip on it. You let it settle. And then once it settles, uh, you can swap it out. And that firmware will never know that the CD has been changed. And it will attempt, if you put in a CD with a full talk, right, it says the full 800 megs, you can now do a DD, and whereas before you were seeing no data, you can do a DD, and it'll give a ton of error sectors, but you'll actually see what the trick is. You'll actually see the data on there. So it's how you, that's how you go about getting data off a CD that you couldn't even read before. Um, some tricks that you really need to do are um, CDs and DVDs that are exactly the same, right? But the die, um, the same manufacturer we found is better. And we just keep doing that over and over and over. Um, you'll also be amazed at the same with the hard drives. When you see Scott Molson's talk, I think he was here before me. When you see, um, try it on different OSs, try it on different readers. Um, you know, I was amazed at just how many things didn't go, um, that didn't go easy. I think this actually got out of place here. But uh, does anybody want to actually? Do anybody want to say anything about um, data recovery? Any tricks or tips they've learned? I actually think I have another slide in there. No. All right. <laughs> Um, did anybody want to say anything about like audio stag or uh, s stag tools or anything they've learned to kind of help you crack those or go after them? All right, I'm gonna keep going then. Um, yeah, here's where the data recovery picks up. 
The DVD and CD writers are much better at reading damaged media. So the first thing you want to do is you want to go out there and you want to find a, uh, a writer, it's like a DVD writer to, to process your damaged DVD. And this is cool, even just your kid scratches it up and it's his favorite Barney or whatever. But um, <laughs> I think I talk about this, CD Freaks, it's a forum for duplicators. Um, and when you read their stuff, they're really like, oh, you can get 10 times the duplication out of these drives and these drives. And when you have damaged media, this is how you recover it. And uh, we actually learned a ton from these guys. Uh, they love their light-on drives, and they love their, prex, uh, their Plex doors. Um, they love it early, so you've got to get it off eBay, so these 12Xs and Pioneer. Um, I actually, for the DVD, I use A111. Yeah, A111. And that one's been doing great for me. The new challenge has a lot of broken media, and that was kind of cool. Uh, number one rule is you don't try stuff. You don't, like, you know, you just stick it in and try to read it first. Don't clean it first, anything like that. You'll find that that can actually be, I don't know, damaging, but... We found that just try to read it first, and then if it fails, then start using the alcohol, ivory soap and water. Um, don't use Windex, sir. I would do the cleaning first. The question was, um, if you can't read it right away, do you do the CD swap first, where you can get past the media bad media check? Or do you try to clean it first? I would try to clean it first at that point. Uh, normally, I just go with if I can get a read, even if it's like you know error and it's slow, I still try to do the read. But um, yeah, I definitely try to clean it before you you do the swap. The swap's a pretty big deal. It has to do with alignments um, of the of the CD and getting a, a CD that's close to the other CDs. So uh, so that's pretty big. I haven't seen my time signal, but uh, we'll see how it's going here. Um, and the other thing is, lots of recovery software exists. But none of it works if you can't get past the media not found. And that's kind of the, really the big thing I learned and wanted to share. Um, because once you get through that, then you can start using all these other tools. My team, uh, for some reason, they like Bad Copy Pro a lot. Maybe there's somebody here that made that. I don't know. But uh, I'm a big DD fan and DD Rescue. So if I, can't, if I can't live through the whole DD run, DD Rescue will actually randomize the sectors it tries to get. So maybe you, know, you won't just get error after error of a bad area. You'll start it. You can force it to start at the, the end and then go backwards. So that's kind of cool. On track, of course, they're big drive manufacturers and they do stuff. But uh, mostly it was ISO Buster, Access Data FTK Imager, um, which they actually used ISO Buster to create the, their Imager product. And like I said, they love Bad Copy Pro. Um, a lot of these things you can get the trial. Obviously, you, know, you can get the full uh, DD. Um, the next section I had was for file systems and mounting, the stuff we used. Um, obviously, there's a ton of great VMware disk tools out there, so you can build your own. Um, images and disks and then build them back in and do all your forensics inside of there and that's pretty cool. Um, we also like mounting DD drives. Uh, obviously it's easy to do in, uh, in Linux. You can do a simple search and find that. But uh, for Windows 32 we actually found one and this of course is on the CD. Wouldn't necessarily go run, write it down right away. But, uh, and of course you've you know, got to put your EXT2 and three drivers if you want to mount these drives and run them in any of these other tools. Like I said, I'm, I love WinHex and I haven't been able to duplicate that in any of my Linux environments. But uh, I keep bringing stuff back in so I can work on it through there. And then of course some boot CD-ROMs. I'm a big Backtrack fan, so that was always been my number one. But I actually like Helix a lot. As part of this, uh, you know, it's there's a lot of there's data recovery, um, and of course STD. The team was big on that. And then um, if you ever do any like forensics on uh, Spark, I don't know. I had to reinvent the wheel. We used to have these great CDs, and somehow they stopped working. And um, I recently had to go back and say, hey, I need to do the Spark recovery or a Spark uh, forensics exercise, you know, and nothing works. So I found Gen 2. Uh, it worked just great. I mean, it, it seemed to be better than the, the Red Hat for Spark and, and some of those other things. But they're, they're starting to really, nobody's really making for it anymore, I think is the problem. Um, but hopefully neither is uh, anybody that's writing Spark. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. And that's basically it. Any questions? Question right here. Say again, I'm sorry. I have, um, but not really enough to say you know, like any kind of great methodology. The, the question was, uh, have we done any forensics on VMware snapshots, which are pretty cool. Um, but no, I haven't actually had like a full-on case where I pulled out some information on that. Sorry. You got anything you want to say about it? Oh, okay. <laughs> Trust me, I mean, hey, I, it may happen soon. You never know. Um, any other questions? Anyone? Oh, here's a question right here, sir. Uh, 
Um, I do not know. The question is, is for the password cracking, which ones did they get? And this is the information I would have loved to have seen, right? Because uh, I thought these were really, really tough. And I don't know is the answer. Um, my guess would be that the 40-bit, because there actually are tools out there to just crack. You don't go after the, you know, you're not trying to brute force it with letters. You're going after the actual 40 bits. And I think that's what they did. And um, I, I've seen it for Word files in the past. And uh, I think it takes like a day or two. But that would have been my guess. But I, I can't say for sure. I mean, when you look at some of these the actual passwords used, I just I can't believe that anybody's really going to crack those. The question was, for each of these challenges, you must show a methodology. And the answer was no, it was not shared this time. And that's really why I did this presentation, is I wanted to share at least my methodology and the kind of things we were thinking and trying to experiment on. Uh, from what I understand, there was, just a, there was a small, it, this was the first time they did it. It was some management issues and that they, they meant to. Um, I'd love for someone if they could say something about it. But uh, anyway, that, that's the thing. And that's really what I felt strong about. was like, I'm giving into this, and I wanted to see some of the methodologies back. I would love to learn a little bit more. Um, I heard actually as a, as a, you know, kind of a, just a random statement was that everybody did the CD-ROM challenge differently. So there was like, I think 11 teams that turned it in and supposedly they were all different. And that seems kind of interesting to me of like how they went out and got that. Because it really was a balancing issue in this case and it wasn't split down the middle and you had to jump the crack. So, any, any other questions? That was a great question. Cool. Anyone? How am I doing on time? Two minutes? Okay. Great, great. I uh, was worried. I didn't see you. So I'm like, you know, how am I doing? I couldn't keep track of my time this time for some reason. I just came off a massive head cold. Yes, sir? Say again. I'm sorry. Uh, the question is crinkled up uh, floppy, the, uh, floppy media. And I believe it's going to be the same. Um, if it's not actually cut, I would probably attempt to, you know, just press it. You know, I would go ahead and remove it. I would press it down. It'd be a lot of the same, and get rid of it as much as you can. Um, you know, I'd probably test it a few times. I want to see if ironing works. To be honest, you know, like you know, with the right stuff, um, it's you're worried about the magnetics, but I think it can handle some heat. Uh, those drives get hot, and um, so it's something along those lines. I really think that you're going to run into the same thing where you're just you're going to hit error after error, and you just need to build in a method to uh, to ignore the errors and let it go for a long time. Uh, we were surprised we got what we got, especially we got like over 60% on one of our tests. And it really we did run like 20 tests. I mean, we had CDs, uh, floppies, I mean, I'm sorry, floppies all over the place. And uh, I think everybody took home like five, and there that was their homework was to do that. But it was interesting. Yep. Anyway. Um, cool. Any other questions? You can hit me up. I do a Q&A afterwards. If it's okay if you don't come, because then I get to leave. But uh, anyway. Great. Well, thank you very much.